Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Cars and Coffee with me, Kenny Brown. And if you're a car guy that wants to learn more about cars and performance, you're in the right spot. Because over the next hour or so, I'm going to talk a little tech, answer your questions, all based off of my 40 plus years of professional motorsports and building really great cars. And we've got kind of a really cool lineup today. Uh, based off of a question from last week, we're going to have Ben O'Connor as a special guest from Impact Racing talking about helmets and head restraints. Uh, on the, on the uh, oh, for the memorabilia, uh, where M69 is, is on the docket for today. We had somebody ask about M69 last week. And we thought, well, that's, that's one of my coolest cars I ever built. So why don't we give that a little bit of feature today? Uh, and then also we've got... Uh, uh see oh we're going to a little tech on jrz's and a little bit different spin on the jrz's today uh and then of course answer your questions and we have a lot of questions from the speed therapy society uh you know that's where the the questions come from for, for saturday mornings and that's sort of how i shape what i'm going to talk about uh, and if you're not a member of speed therapy society please join uh it's, it's a great group we're going to be doing more and more as as time goes on with that but the next big thing is the, the big reveal of my new suspension is going to happen uh, just to the Speed Therapy Society people and not the general public. And we'll have, uh, that's going to be later in February. And I think next week, Carrie said we're going to, registration will be open. It'll be a special closed event and it'll be on Zoom, uh, not Facebook. So it'd be more like a, you know, kind of a more, more of an intimate type thing. Uh, so uh, join the society, send me in your questions. Of course, remember, if you got questions today, send them in, and I'll try to do it, answer if I can uh, live. And then also, if you have any questions for Ben when he's on, you know, send questions in for him too. So mo moving down my little list, I think the uh, uh, it also we're also simulcasting, or try casting, I guess you'd say. We're on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and then also Impact Racing's Facebook page. So it's kind of like a, a, a triple header today. And, and, and also welcome to all the Impact Racing folks out there. Uh, we're glad you can join us. You know, we, uh, we love the Impact, so, uh, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, the artwork today is something that's kind of super extra special. Uh, we had a, a good friend that we hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, also one of, our, like, trusted, been one of our trusted advisors over the year. Drop by one morning and bring back uh, a piece of artwork that's very special. Uh, he, uh, when I got, after I got sick, he's been keeping it kind of safe for us. And, uh, you know, he's in and out of town so much, like we hadn't seen him for a long time. And he, he dropped this off. And this is what it is. Now, let me try to explain. Uh, for anybody that's been to Indianapolis, uh, Union Jack's pub is kind of like, was the place back in the 90s when we got here. That was the absolute the place to go. And... It was, you know, it's kind of like what's called the wind tunnel. Some some uh, uh, race team managers would not let their their mechanics go to Union Jacks because it quote the wind tunnel. Everybody start chatting back and forth and give away secrets. Anyway, there was there was a guy that had been, had been kind of a fixture there, Ron Burton, who's an incredible artist. In fact, the the whole uh, Union Jacks pub was uh, had just a bunch of his artwork along with his helmet collection, which was extensive. Anyway, long story short. Uh, Kerry went to Ron in 96 and commissioned this, this painting. Uh, and this is it's called uh, Kenny's Wild Horses. It's an acrylic, and uh, it's, it's hard to see. It was actually one, two, three, four, five, six uh, of my Mustangs in there. And um, uh, those are all Mustangs that were in, in, in the media at one point in time. So that's kind of a special piece. Uh, it's, it's me. It's, it's irreplaceable. Uh, so yeah, Kenny's Wild Horses by Ron Burton. It's uh, it, it's pretty incredible. He has a very unique style of painting. That's I don't think unmatched by anybody. Uh, we let the impact uh, people know that uh, Ben will be on about ten or quarter. Uh, for the people on impact, yeah, uh, Ben will be on in just a little bit. We need to get through our normal housekeeping stuff and some questions, and the questions lead into Ben. So. Uh, moving right along, uh, it's the share thing. If, if you like what we're going to be talking about, you know, please share it with your friends. There's a little button up there that you can click on, click on the button and just, you know, invite all your friends to share with it. That's been pretty popular. A lot of people do that. It was pretty, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so let's dive into, I think the first story today is M69. 
this is this is absolutely one of the prettiest and by far the most expensive car that I've ever built. And this was for this was a concept I did for the SEMA show in 2005. Uh, and the story behind it is I know I was at that, that time I was back and forth in Detroit quite a bit, knew a lot of people up there. And there's this, this one group of folks I knew that were trying to, you know, put a, a 69 body panels, steel body panels onto a 05 Cobra or 05 Mustang. And I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. But, you know, for me, I, I got to get big tires. So the end, we ended up doing a, a project. It was like six, eight months. Seemed like it took forever where we created uh, a wide body 69 version of the 05 Mustang. And what made it so unique and incredibly expensive is that it actually started in clay. Uh, the body stuff was done in, in clay, and then the clay was uh, put onto, uh, you know, the, the whole clay, fiberglass, fiberglass, that whole thing. And then the final sculpting was actually done on the car. You're making me dizzy. So, I mean, it, it's, and also what we, we did, we introduced our, you know, the, the latest Gen 4, AGS 4.0 suspension was on that car in 2005 at SEMA. But I mean, the body work, you know, got all the, all the, all the attention. And, you know, back then we had like, you know, really wide tires. The eight, 18 inch was like the big deal back then. Uh, of course, this is about 15 years ago. Uh, so we got super wide 18 inch tires and there's, you can just see by the front fenders you know, how much we've added. We added to the body. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. And looking at the back, I mean, if you take a good look, you can see kind of where the where the tail lights end and where the body keeps going out. And it was, I mean, this was done. The guys that did this were amazing, uh, extremely talented. But you know, get up to Detroit and get all these these concept car building people, and they're really good at what they work at what they do. But it was. I can just say it was stupid expensive, but my gosh, what, what a gorgeous looking car. Not only was it gorgeous, it, it, it drove, it, it was amazing to drive. We've had, uh, we've had every editor that drove the car was just blown away. In fact, one, I think Pete Eppel got, got to do a, an article on it down at VIR, and he said it was just the, the absolute best driving car he's ever been in. And that was, you know, the, that was the beginning of our Gen 4 AGS uh, 4.0. And anybody that's got rear grip kit, front grip kit in the car know what I'm talking about. Uh, gosh, you're killing me, Carrie. <laughs> I'm not in control. I'm not in control. Okay, can we just go slowly through this? Sure. So I mean, there, there's, a, there's a good shot at the front. Next, please. And I think you can see this, this kind of demonstrates just how wide the front was. <laughs> also, the big air vents we put in. And I'm always talking about getting the air out of the hood. To help front downforce, well, by by putting this in you know, right behind the fan, the flares, what that does is there's you know, high pressure builds up in the very front of the tire, rotating uh, tire, and that helps bleed off the pressure that builds up in in the wheel well. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, and in the engine, we really didn't do a lot to that. We did uh, you know headers, uh, cold air, we did a tune. I think we were at like uh, I think uh, 385. Is that right? Now, what did they come with? Gosh, 300 horsepower, yeah. So we got up like, like 380, 385. However, uh, it was uh, a friend of mine bought it a number of years back and has been looking after it very very uh, lovingly. Uh, and they went ahead and did a little engine work, had an extra 100 horsepower thing. is just really a little rocket ship now. And the other little thing I might mention is this car is, uh, you know, the uh, – uh, my friend that has it is out of space, and we we hear that a lot. So his the car is for sale again. Uh, it's it, this is I, I just can't tell you how beautiful this car is a person. And there's the you know the dash. Uh, it's a serialized uh, Kenny Brown car. It was originally called the uh, GT4 CSR 69. Well, you know we always kind of nicknamed our cars. And that was too long, so the, the our nickname for it was just M69. You know the the plaque under under the uh, under the hood. Uh, it is, I mean, it's a gorgeous car. And there's just, look, he went too fast. That's just a smattering of the, I mean, it's, it's been in a lot of, a lot of magazines. That's just a smattering uh, of, the, of the magazine articles. But boy, like I say, if you know anybody that might be interested in, in a real piece of uh, uh, 
automotive history and a significant part of my history. Uh, the M69, I can't, I, I can tell you that what it costs to build, you add at least six zeros and then some. Because uh, when you start doing, you know, body, you know, starting uh, uh, out of clay and having like three or four guys sculpting, sculpting the clay, then going to fiberglass and putting that on the car and doing the final sculpting on the car, uh, it, it was a pretty extensive. Now, the plan was to actually take that to market, but unfortunately, that was at the end of, of uh, 05, and that's when I had some serious health issues and had to sort of drop out for a while. And the car just sat. I mean, it sat, and then we we brought it back and tuned it up. And then you know, Michael really liked the car, and so we uh, kind of sold it to him uh, to take care of. And uh, he's he's out of space. So yeah, if, if, you know, share this with some of your friends if you think they might want a real piece of American automotive history and one of the most beautiful Mustangs you will ever cast your eyes on. No matter wherever we went with it, at like car shows and anything, it is a total camera magnet. I mean, I can't tell you anywhere we go how many people take pictures of that car. Uh, that, that tells you something special when it when when they're a cam camera magnet and people drive or walk past other cars just to look at this one. So I think I probably rattled on enough about M69, but it, it's it's just an amazing car with an amazing history. So, and like I say, it was a concept that was supposed to go to market, but unfortunately, that whole stupid health thing just got in the way of it. Like a number of my my uh, projects went on the shelf, like my rear suspension went on the shelf back then uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to sign up for it in Speed Therapy Society. society. Uh, next week, the registration will be open, and then towards the end of February, we'll have a reveal probably on a Thursday evening, uh, so I know ahead of time. The reveal party. Now, uh, the, the Speed Therapy Academy uh, alumni people have already seen it. Uh, in fact, most of them bought one. They just 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 seen the prototype. But what I will all introduce you to is the actual the rear production pieces, and I can tell you that the the, the shift from prototypes to production is uh, it's a big step. And this is this is a pretty complex piece. It's pretty cool. What it do? What it do? What it, what it does is totally amazing. Uh, so if you're just joining us, you got that without you telling me. If you're just joining us, I'm Kenny Brown. This is Cars and Coffee, and uh, well, we're talking tech, answering questions, and just being kind of all-around car guys. And if you see the little share button, share that. Send some thumbs up in the air, a little love. Uh, you, we like all that. And think it on the is it on? You have to click, put thumbs up on the. Yeah, it's right above where they're looking. There. Right above where you're looking, sort of thumbs up go. Yeah. So here we go. <laughs> yeah, I already knew that, Carrie. Okay. You know, well, it gives me pause. I keep telling people that you know she she writes left-handed and I have right-handed eyes, so it kind of takes me a while to adjust. And uh, we got to get to our questions. Okay. Well, one of my questions is, well, okay. why Ben's here? Okay. Well, go ahead. I'll zip through zip through the questions. Uh, Hershiver has a question on coilover setup that I'll talk about a little later with GRZs. Wendy said she had found something about, about pressure cats for late model cars. Uh, we'd like to know more about that. Uh, it's a wheel. Uh, you're moving up to 18 inch wheels, 18 by 9, 18 by 10. Uh, he wants to know what oh, the best tire size to have minimum minimum difference in speedometer reading. Well, that's well, you know, it's hard to tell unless we know what the diameter is of the tires you have now. Uh, but it's there's an easy way to do it. Uh, going to it's going to uh, oh, tire rack and you look up a tire. I'll, I'll give you an example. Like uh, uh, what we ran a lot of, of on the 10 inch 80, 18 by 10 on SN95s was a 285 35. That's like a 25.9 inch tall tire. Uh, and that's pretty close. That's a little shorter than OE. Uh, but a 285.40, if you can find them, like 27-inch tall tire. So you need to look up the size of your tire under the specs part and what the diameter is, and then look at the options on the 18s and try to come as close as you can. Uh, let's see. Now, GA, this is another another tire question. Uh, what do I recommend for street tires that are trackable? I'm looking for something to replace Sport Cup 2s on my uh, 19 GT350, something with a little more tread life. Uh, yeah, the other, I mean... There's always a compromise between grip and tread life. 
Uh, Sport Cup 2s are a really grippy tire, but, you know, like they're, they're not the most, most long-lived tire. I've got a couple suggestions, and it, it just kind of all depends. The interesting thing is the Sport Cup 2 has a tread wear rating of 180, uh, which is which is pretty low. But, on you know, the, we use a lot of Pirellis. We also use Michelin's, but we use a lot of Pirellis. And the tread rating on the, like the P0 Corsa is a 60. And I know to me that lasts longer than the, the 180 on the Sport Cup 2s. The other weird thing is the uh, Trafay, Pirelli Trafay R's also have a, a tread rating of 60. And I can tell you that the, the courses outlast the, the uh, uh, Trafayo is like two to one. So, I mean, that, that the Trafayo, the, uh, uh, the Pirelli uh, uh, courses might be something to try. I mean, it's a true track tire. I mean, you don't give up very much grip off of the Sport Cup 2s uh, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, courses and they have some tread <clears throat> so it's like a street track it's a track street tire let's call it that if you're looking for a pure street tire uh what we use the most of is the michelin uh, uh pilot uh s4 uh really good tire but again that's got a tread rating of 300 it's, it's going to work on the street it's going to work on the track but the level of grip is going to be significantly less than on the sport cup twos so it's kind of like you just you know you have to do you know weigh your your uh you're, you know, if a friend told me a long time ago that life is a series of compromises. And you know, when it comes to cars, that is that, that is pretty much it. And let's see, Dan wanted to know, off topic, uh, some of us to do work on our own cars. Where are bolts <clears throat> that can be used once? And where are the bolts that have only been used once in the chassis and maybe the engine? Well, I can tell you there are a lot of them. And what I mean by bolts that are used once, there's something that, that Ford has gone to of late called a uh, uh, torque oh, just dropped right out of my head yield to torque uh, bolt and to give you an example we just put we just put new cam bolts on cliff's engine and the yield to torque was you torque it to 30 pounds plus 90 degrees and because you're actually the torque is stretching the bolt to a specific uh, specific rate uh, they're they're throwaways uh, the best thing I can tell you is just re refer to a manual, a uh, workshop manual. I know on the suspension, uh, we don't worry about that because we pretty much uh, replace all the factory hardware with grade eight, uh, with grade eight hardware. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of them. I can tell you that, uh, but you're going to have to just, if you're working on something, you'll find a manual and see which bolts are torque yield. I think somebody once told me if it's gray, you throw it away. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but I thought that was kind of clever. Uh, let's see, Oscar. Ah, oh, it's another good one. Oscar is a 2003 GT convertible. He wants it to go faster. How to do it and do it economically. Okay, we're getting into this compromise thing again. Uh, economically and speed sort of don't go together. I think you, you want to change that from economically to cost effective. Uh, because when I was a young lad uh, and, and, and doing like uh, cars back in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s, it was, it went, I always went to Charlie Speed Shop. I mean, Speed Shops were the place to go back then. Not only they had the parts, but it's kind of like everybody kind of gathered and chatted. But they had a great big sign up on the wall <clears throat> that said, speed costs money. How fast can you afford to go? And I can tell you that stuck with me, and that is as true today as it was back then. However, there are cost-effective things you can do to improve the performance of your car. Uh, that's something that if you want to set up a 15-minute uh, consult, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it a little bit. Uh, but remember, for me, it's going to be chassis, suspension, wheel, tires, brakes, uh, the first thing to do before you start adding power, because just doing that little bit to the car just makes a huge difference. And I'll have a good example of that next week, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Okay, now, this is Gary's question, which is a holdover from last week. Uh, and Gary asked, he said, the helmet recommendations for first-time track day driver. Well, I can tell you from my perspective, whether it's a first day or an advanced driver, uh, you know, the, the helmet recommendations are going to be the same. The only difference is is, is budget because, I mean, you got to keep the noggin safe. But I know somebody who knows more about this than I do, and he is our special guest today, uh, Ben O'Connor, who we have known for ages. In fact, uh, we first met Ben when we started working with Bear Brakes, I think back in the 90s. But now he's now he's a, an impact uh, uh, rep uh, with uh, a great company 
and great product. So if we could have Ben join us. Hey. Hey, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Thought I would uh, join you in the meeting here. Kind of uh, wearing something a little stylish here. This is a... This is a helmet from the uh, 2013 uh, Indianapolis 500 that's been autographed by the drivers there. We'll use this to kind of go over a few things today, too. We'll probably need to back up so everybody can see it. All right. That just messed my hair up there. It's, right, it's, called, it's called helmet hair. Anybody who's <laughs> ever been on track, it's all that helmet hair. There we go. So there's there's your first uh, helmet lesson of the day or uh, issue helmet. How to prevent helmet hair. No. <laughs> Can't. It's impossible. Yeah, it is impossible. Yeah, I've been doing that a long time. It is definitely impossible. Um, the only trick to helmet hair is as soon as you get out of the car, your head sweaty. It's coming real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, put my glasses back on here so I can so I can see you. All right. So I, I believe the, uh, the the intro or the uh, question at hand or task at hand here was. Uh, Maybe some tips on uh, buying, buying a first helmet, right? So, um, Kenny did pretty cap encapsulated pretty well. I mean, that's that's really the, uh, the, the 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 main keys of it is you know you want to buy. I always said you, you want to buy as much helmet as you can afford. There are differences in higher end helmets, lower end helmets. However, like most things, there is a cost diminishing returns. Right, you're going to get that 80 percent for that first initial uh, expense, and then everything after that. Right, you're getting that extra 20 percent. In the world of helmets, um, it, from from the from the entry level, at least with ours, throughout the uh, all the way up to the to the top level stuff. In terms of impact resistance, right, you're, you're going to get equal performance and protection as far as that goes. Right, there's no um, uh, huge benefits to going with a $1,600 carbon fiber helmet versus a $400 uh, fiberglass helmet. However, there are secondary considerations uh, that come into play um, when you're looking at, at a more expensive helmet like that. Some of them may just be features, maybe as simple as just cosmetics. The cosmetics takes a little bit more to, to manufacture, so uh, the cost comes from that. Uh, the look of the helmet you know, in terms of carbon fiber, but one of the biggest things is, is weight. And like anything else related to the automotive world uh, and performance, um, you know, I used to have the saying where, where I used to work in a sprint car world, I think it costs a lot to go horsepower, try to make something light, <laughs> right? And that, that holds true with, uh, with helmets as, as much as anything else. But there is a benefit to have a lightweight helmet uh, in that it helps prevent you know, secondary injuries. You want to prevent impact type injuries with the helmet, of course. Everybody understands that. But a lot of injuries in an event are also caused by head whippage, you know, when your head's moving around. And, you know, if you, the heavier the helmet, the more likelihood you are to uh, maybe get a, an injury that way, a neck injury or even a, a basilar uh, injury where the neck enters the, the back of the skull there. This is why FHRs were developed and, uh, to, to help prevent those, those types of injuries. But, you know, they can't prevent every motion. You know, they do a really good job of preventing that frontal movement, so it comes from FHR, uh, frontal head restraint, um, but not as good off axis. They're pretty good off to maybe 45 degrees or so, but when you start getting 90 degrees, there's not a lot of protection really keep your head from moving around. This is why you've seen the advent of like halo style seats um, and, and driver's net, things like that to help prevent that motion as well. So, you know, having a lighter weight helmet uh, slows that velocity down, um, helps prevent that, but it also helps prevent or slows the or reduces the impact when you do hit something. Obviously, if, you're, if it's lighter, not moving as fast, the impact if you do hit the roll bar padding or whatever that is. Uh, is it's going to be at a lower velocity as well. So that that's one of the things. But one of the things you want to look at um, is the fitment of the helmet. Obviously, you want to make sure that the helmet fits correctly. And, when we, and, and really, the primary importance is around the crown of your head. 
right? You want to make sure the helmet fits really well there. And Kenny, I don't know if you're, if you're okay with me going to helmet fitment. I don't know if that was the scope of what you wanted to discuss. Or if you had oh, sure. Get- I mean, and it's, uh, I also want you to talk about Snell 20 because I know that's out. Yeah. Which reminds me, I got to get a new helmet this year too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, we want to fit the, the, the crown of the, the, the head, right? That's the most important thing. And, and one of the tests that, that people will do is you can put the helmet on and you should be able to get your, you know, get your thumb up in there. Um, but, but just a little bit, just about maybe to the first, to the first knuckle. Um, if you can stick your, you know, your knuckle up in there, then it's definitely too loose. Um, if you can't get it up in there, it's probably too tight or if it hurts, if it's to the point of pain, uh, then obviously it's too tight. Now, keeping that in mind, you want the helmet tight. Tighter is better than than looser, and that also helps prevent uh, concussions in the sense that we're eliminating. We're trying to eliminate the the. In any event, there's a series of impacts that happen when the helmet hits, comes in contact with 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 anything, right? Because the helmet shell stops, your your skull continues to move inside the helmet till it makes contact with the uh, liner of the helmet. And then your brain inside the skull then also continues to move. So you have this multiple impact event that happens whenever, whenever you have something. So if you have a tight helmet, you can at least reduce one of those motions, that secondary one where the skull moves inside the helmet, you can greatly reduce that one. And anytime you do that, you're reducing without getting too technical harmonics and you know the emotion right so so that that's real important so you want to do that and with our helmets too getting back to the fitment get this right and then we have adjustable or uh, not adjustable but different size cheek pads you can use to to customize that fit around the around the jaws and, and ears so so if you get a helmet that feels really good here but it's really tight on the ears or the or the jaws we can do a, a thinner cheek pad uh, likewise, if it's really good here and you've got a lot of space there, we can we have thicker cheek pads uh, to help tune up that 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 fitment. Um, one of the things you get, we'll get into Snell here real quick. Um, we get a lot of I said a lot of questions, but there's a lot of uh, uh, you say mystery uh, regarding Snell and and what it is. And I'm going to briefly go over. Um, the Snell program first and, and what the objective is in doing that. And I don't work for Snell, so I'm not going to get into anything in depth. If you want to, uh, Snell has a lot of information on their website. Um, I encourage people to go there and, and, and do some research there. You'll re- really learn a lot about what goes into the process and what, what they look for the different criteria. But the idea being is every five years, Snell changes the uh, criteria for uh, the helmets to meet they change the, the the standards that they must meet right every every five years the idea being that the helmets get incrementally safer um every, every five years so technically not, and this isn't 100 percent, but in theory the helmet that you would buy today in 2020 helmet would be in, in theory safer than the 2015 or 2010 or 2005 and, and this is one of the reasons why the sanctioned bodies have adopted a policy of only allowing typically the current Snell and, and prior Snell versions. Uh, so if you go to the track and they say, hey, your helmet's no longer uh, allowed to be run, that, that's why. They, they're, they're following Snell guidelines, which, which, is, uh, which is wise. Um, just to ensure that you've got the most current technology but also helmets do they don't wear out in the sense like tires and things like that but they are largely composites um in those composites I and mean, you're dealing with fiberglass and resins and things like that they can harden or dry out and change and you've got styrofoam and liners and, and that stuff can degrade over time so it's, it is a good idea to, to change the helmet periodically anyways um depending on what you're doing now, in, in certain sports like off road, they replace them a lot more frequently than they do in other sports, just because of the you know they get a lot of debris and, and damage to the helmet that way too. So if you've got you know a nick on the helmet or something like that, um, you know a big big chunk out of it, then you definitely need to replace it, right? So but that's that's the real big deal. And you know, for manufacturers as us, we we have to meet that that challenge every five years, and it keeps us going and in, in developing better products for the for the motorsport industry. 
I think I'm muted. Yeah, I am. Oh, I'm muted. Yeah. Get this. This is a bad as Zoom. You're always in a Zoom meeting and you call on somebody. And you're gonna... <laughs> yeah. 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 Terry, Terry said she muted me because you hear me slurping my coffee. This is cars and coffee. So, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but why don't you, why don't you give just a, a just a, a real brief summary of the, the head and neck restraint and how important that is? Yeah. So right, we touched on that a little bit, right, as a means to prevent some of those the those neck type injuries or. What, it, what we're really, to get more specific, it's a, a basilar uh, skull fracture, and that is the, the base of your skull, the back, that's your basilar, and that's the point where your spine meets the bottom of your skull. That's the injury that killed Dale Earnhardt, and that's probably the most notable instance of uh, someone dying from that type of injury in motorsports, and was also the catalyst which drove the whole movement uh, for FHRs to be used in motorsports here in the state. They'd already been doing it in Europe a little bit, right? It's already gained some traction over there. But, but that really highlighted the importance of preventing these types of injuries. It is, it, it, you know, next, it, like a helmet, I shouldn't say next, like a helmet and like restraints uh, is probably done, probably say, you know, as many lives or more lives than, than anything else out there. I mean, the technology absolutely works. It's very simple. And, and I'll go over that real briefly. Uh, what happens in FHR, and I'm sorry I don't have one here today, um, the device sits on your shoulders, the restraints go over the top of it. There are tethers that fasten your helmet. Now, any helmet you buy, SA 2015 or 2020 or 2015 or newer, has the anchor points built into the helmet that is a requirement for SA 2015 and forward. So, you would have these anchors on your helmet that the tethers would clip into. Now, in an event, what happens is that your body moves underneath the restraints. The restraints actually holds the device in place. Your body moves underneath. That takes up that tension in the tethers, and that prevents that forward uh, frontal movement. And by doing that, that's what prevents the, the basilar uh, injury. Um, Interesting to know that there are different types of devices and they do it in different ways. The most common one is everybody knows the originator of the technology is, is Hans. Um, and that is uh, like what I just described. There are other devices on the market. Some of them strap on to you. Um, uh, they can have some effective. They, they are effective. Uh, many would argue they're not as effective um, and they limit motion and re they restrict your movement somewhat because they don't stay with the restraints because they move with the body the tethers have to be pretty short to prevent that that type of injury so you you, you lose some mobility and motion and, and looking around and right some mobility uh so for that reason you see a lot of people choose to to, to go that other way so um that's just a brief description of, of how those work Okay, cool. Well, uh, I think getting back to the original question, what 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 uh, does impact have as let's say a, a good uh, first helmet? Uh, you know, looking from a budget standpoint, somebody's just getting into, but they, they want you know the quality of a helmet, but you know they don't want to pay fifteen hundred dollars for carbon fiber. I know you've got a real good one because I think we've got it on our website. Yeah, so the uh, one of the most popular helmets we sell, and in, in, in a little bit of price point, but it, it doesn't shortchange how much, is our 1320. Um, it's a simpler design. It's fairly clean looking. doesn't have a lot of bumps and, and, and bells and whistles and, and stuff like that, but it is vented. Um, it has a larger eye port, so it's got really good visibility. Um, it is a fiberglass design. We do build it right in Indianapolis. We are a U.S. manufacturer. We're one of the few, I don't know, I think we may be the only helmet manufacturer that can make that claim right now in terms of making, uh, you know, 95% of our helmets here in the, right, right here in the States, let alone in Indianapolis. Um, same interior, same liner, the, the, the styrofoam, is, if you will, uh, for, for layman's term, um, as the 1600R carbon fiber helmet. So, again, you're not shortchanging yourself on that. Uh, impact re resistance, that element of the safety aspect of the helmet. You're not sure change yourself in terms of visibility. We use the same shield uh, is, is the, the expensive helmets. Um, 
and comfort. The, the liners that we use are really plush, uh, fire rated uh, interior, uh, unlike anything that you're going to find in any of the other brands. And uh, it's for that reason, we get a lot of repeat customers to do the comfort of the helmet. Many, many times people will comment on how comfortable the helmet is. Uh, now you're <laughs> yeah, you mentioned ventilation. I think I can't, it's all gone now, but somebody asked about you know, ventilation because it's, it's hot in Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm in Phoenix, so <laughs> I, I can relate. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. The ventilation is good on that. Now, one of the things that and this is really becoming really pop. It's always been popular in off-road, but it's becoming really, really popular uh, now in, in all forms of motorsports is, is a forced air helmet. And that's where you take, you know, you'll, you'll take a standard helmet and maybe there's an addition of a side air piece on here. I mean, it almost looks like a vacuum cleaner or, outlet or uh, on top of the helmet or uh, like our helmet, the, the, the sign that we originated, we do it offset a little bit, and that's for roof clearance. You have additional roof clearance. Um, it's a game changer. Anybody that's been on track a lot you know, in, in a hot environment in the summertime, it, it, certainly in race cars, we have very little insulation. Um, as we know, the, the interior temperatures can get really high. Having uh, fresh air pumped in the helmet is a game changer. It really makes a big difference in terms of comfort in uh, keeping your head cool, which again, that's one of those other secondary safety aspects, right? Um, the best way to prevent injury is prevent an event from happening. And the best way to prevent an event from happening is to be on your game, be alert and, and, and comfort, uh, comfortable and uh, all of that, right? So you can concentrate on the task at hand, uh, even if it's subconsciously, if you're if something's bothering you, that that can distract you from from your from being focused on, on driving. So, uh, real important. So, anyways, yeah, forced air is awesome for that. But all of our helmets are vented; they all have vents uh, in them for that reason, uh, so they can keep the driver cool. Quite a question on belts. We may have to have you back on that. Three inches versus two inches. <clears throat> really quickly, I'll say two inches are every, every bit as strong as three inch. Uh, I prefer two inch because they work on on the uh, the Hans and they're, they're easier. But I think we might have to have Ben. Actually, Ben did an entire master class on safety and went all through all the different types of harnesses and belts in our Speed Therapy Academy. And uh, do we got time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you throw out a, a quick answer for? Uh, here's the question: What are your thoughts on two inch belts? Are they as safe as three inch? Uh, they look like they would be. Okay. Thanks. It looks like they would be easy to adjust being narrower. I'm considering a five-point cam lock, uh, shoulder mounts. Uh, yeah, Ben can answer that, and I can tell I think we've got those on the website. If not, we can get you hooked up. But go ahead, Ben. Yeah, of course, the last part of that question, affordable, is typically a relative term, of course. Um, <laughs> again, we manufacture everything right here in the States. All the restraints we manufacture right there in Indianapolis. Cam lock restraints from us start around uh, $299. Um, Two inch, I could, I could speak for an hour on two inch alone, but I'm going to run through this real briefly and kind of go over the, the premise of it and, and why it's preferred and why you're seeing it. We used almost exclusively in some forms of motorsport. NASCAR, it's a requirement. You have to run two inch. You can't even show up with three inch. And, and here's the brief synopsis of why that is. The idea of it, when it comes to the, um, being restrained in a vehicle, it's the focus is on the hip more than anywhere else and it's because it's the largest load carrying capacity part of the, of the body for one, but um, it has to be restrained properly because things happen during an event that can cause the, the hip bones to, to rotate, uh, which can create spinal injuries. Um, there are also instances where if the belt gets up too high, it can create internal injuries. If it gets up over the top of your, your hip bone, then the iliac crest get to get technical then that can get in your stomach and that really is one of the primary functions of anti-sub belts um which a lot of people don't know that's really what they're about um the, so the two inch restraint what it does is it helps keep the belt below that iliac crest for one and again that helps prevent that internal injury from it coming up over the top of the iliac crest but it also helps prevent pelvic tilt in a in a forward motion event 
uh, to prevent lower back injury in an event like that. It, the other side benefit is that you can absolutely get a two inch belt tighter than you can three inch. And the reason being is if I'll try to do it and show you here on the, on the camera, but if you, if you imagine, uh, let me see here, right? If you take, take your hand, right? The full width hand and set it in the cup of your hand to push it down in there, you've got to distort your hand to get it to sit down in that cup. Now, if you pull in a finger, take the three fingers in there you'll notice that immediately it sits down in the bottom of the of the cup of your hand much easier and that's the same premise with the restraint by going the two inch it's already down in that hip pocket uh the ilium of, of the hip bone and that just allows you because it's already closer to the surface and tighter to the body and you don't have to distort the belt you can just get them tighter and having a tight restraint is the annual test is paramount to safety particularly in the laps uh, because again, that, that keeps things from moving around. Also, again, that lo large load carrying capacity of the body. Um, it's what keeps you anchored in the seat. Even if you, if you, if you run a loose restraint shoulders, if they're wonky for some reason, um, uh, having a really tight lap belt is, is, you know, really going to help in those situations. Um, if you want the shoulders to be proper, of course, but, but you can get away with more that way than you can the other. You want the laps proper. You, know, you want them good and tight. Uh, whereas uh, the shoulders, if they're a little loose, but your laps tight, you're, you're probably going to be okay. The other way around, there's a lot more likelihood that you're, you're going to get an injury. Can't hear you, Kenny. Kenny, your mic's off. <laughs> what are you just talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was saying that our producer kind of was asleep at the wheel over there. Uh, yeah, I, I've been using two inch belts since forever before they even popular. I just like them a lot more. You know, I'm, I'm not a big guy and they just seem to work a lot better. Uh, how, how did you actually get going in, in this whole industry? Because I know I met you, we met when you were at uh, Bear Breaks, which is like seems like a yeah. few years ago. Yeah, I, you know what? I am a, uh, a lifer for sure. I I got into the into the sport through my, my first car, the original sport compact Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> um, you know, got bought one when I was 16 and immediately started working on it. I, but I'd come up racing BMX and, and all that stuff. My father's mechanic and a racer, boat racer, and, you know, so I'd always been around that stuff and, and working tinkering on stuff my whole life. So for me, that was a uh, you know, a likely path. And I had friends that also met in high school that were into that stuff. My first job was at a really large mail order Volkswagen uh, outfit back in the back that I'm going to date myself in the early 80s there, uh, Station One. Some of you may recognize the name. And then, uh, but from there, I've been, you know, in the industry the whole time, typically working, you know, places for long periods of time. I've been that I uh, work for Klein Engines where we did sprint car uh, engines and, you know, drag race engines, high performance stuff. That was a really cool job. Uh, I was engine uh, sales and, and designer. I, I actually got to design a lot of the engines there for things outside the sprint car world, drag racing, things like that. So that was really cool. I got a really strong technical background knowledge of, of the internal combustion engine and I get in all kinds of crazy stuff and rod angles and, you know, sonar flow rates and all that stuff and how it all correlates to each other. And then from there, I went to uh, Bear Brakes, and where I spent 11 years. Uh, so, you know, a strong technical background in the braking systems as well. Um, you know, I can, I can explain exactly what head film transfer is and, you know, warp rotors, the, that phenomenon. I can explain that to you and all how that stuff works, too. So it's for me really was a way to use my, uh, my, my quest for knowledge, technical knowledge and, and tinkering and things like that. So... I've uh, done some motocross over the years, and competition side of things, and, you know, of course, working on those as well. So, but yeah, that's, that's a, a, a lengthy <laughs> answer to your question, but that's how I got involved in the industry. Well, that's, that's awesome. I think, uh, <clears throat> like I say, Ben uh, was one of our, did a master class in the, uh, I was using it again, wasn't I? No, you are. Oh, Okay. Uh, ben was one of our uh, special guests in the, in the master class for the Speed Therapy Academy. And I can tell you, he spent maybe 35, 40 minutes talking about safety stuff, and that wasn't even enough. Uh, but yeah. uh, we'll have in the next academy, I'm sure he's going to be back uh, as one of our master class special guests. 
and uh, I think uh, uh, we need to probably keep moving along. So, uh, what? Oh, so I'm going to say I'm, thanks so much. Uh, you know, we've, we've been friends for a long time, and you're a wealth of knowledge, and we really appreciate appreciate you coming on this morning. So again, a big hand round of applause for Ben, everybody. <laughs> Right on, thanks. I appreciate it. I will. Uh, I'll hang in the wings here if something comes up. Let let me let me know. I'll watch okay. the rest of the room. All right. So yeah, So if you got any more questions for Ben, we're kind of well, well. We'll run over. We've always we always run over, so that's not a problem. Send them in. I I saw a couple of questions come up. Uh, Hirsch for one, know if I was going to watch the Twenty Four Hours of Daytona. It is already programmed into my DVR. So uh, it's. Uh, you you gonna watch a twenty four, Ben? Me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll catch a little bit of it here and there. I, my biggest my biggest problem is I'm not a good fan. I want to do it, <laughs> so I watch that stuff, and all I can think about is being there doing it. <laughs> and and so and I can't sit still, as probably uh, people probably noticed just from this deal. I move around a lot. Um, I've always got to be doing something, so I'm not a sit on the couch and, and watch TV thing. But that is one of the races that absolutely uh, pop in and out of you know uh, for those 24 hours. And I love the machines. I mean, I just think they're they're the most incredible, uh, some of the most incredible vehicles on on the planet. You know, I, I like the most extreme aspects of of motorsports. I think, like most people do, you're, you're attracted to the top fuel dragsters more than you are, you know, some of the other stuff, and you know, but but I appreciate all forms of motorsports. So yeah, no, definitely, yeah. Okay, well, thanks. I I I, ha I have it a VCR, a VD, a DVD, VCR, whatever it is. I like, oh, yeah. pro programmed it into my, my cable stuff yeah. because I really I don't have time to sit and and, and watch it. I just don't. Exactly. But I'll be watching it for the next week. Yeah. Uh, kind of pop pop in and out, you know, and uh, watch a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, try to keep up with it. I, I can tell you, it's it's kind of like bittersweet watching that because up until up until I had my health issues in 05, I was at the uh, 24 Hours of Daytona every single year. Uh, I, I I worked for a lot of different teams uh, in 24 hours, uh, and if I didn't have anybody to work for, I would just be there, kind of hanging out with people I knew, and somehow I'd always end up finding something to do. But uh, yeah, really, I I I kind of miss it. Uh, I think uh, well, uh, real quick story. One year I was working with a team. It was a prototype team, and uh, Carrie went down with me. And I said that uh, I said, look, these guys aren't really good. Uh, I mean, they're 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 okay, but they're not really super good. And I thought I think I think we might be at uh, Carabas having dinner about eleven o'clock at night. Well, I made a couple of really good mechanical calls during the night, and the car ran all the way up to I think the twenty twentieth hour, maybe. 19th or 20th hour and then the car broke so but yeah yeah so i didn't we didn't get our dinner at carabas because it's a really good carabas right there in daytona so okay <laughs> thanks again and i saw somebody asked a question about the new rear suspension if you weren't with us earlier uh yes we're getting very close uh, like i said i wanted to introduce you guys to a real production piece and uh, building production pieces versus prototypes is a whole different deal and uh, we want to have some other uh, things to go with that. We will be opening registration. It's going to be a closed event on Zoom, so more like you know, more uh, uh, more intimate on Zoom. And it'll be either the last or next to the last Thursday in February, I think. We'll have more information on that coming up. But registration will open next next week, and you will have to register because it will be a closed event. It's strictly for Speed Therapy Society people. Uh, we introduced it to the Speed Therapy Academy uh, folks uh, earlier on. They got the first look. They saw a prototype. Uh, and uh, they, I can tell you, just, we are, the first production lot is 10, and we already sold that out. I mean, that was like, boom, it's gone. So the, we're going to be building it because of the complexity, and you'll see why we're going to be building with lots of 10 initially. Uh, and then uh, as we get a you know, little more volume up, then we'll, we'll probably increase that. But... Uh, so the, the I, I should say probably the next next the deposits are open for the next time, but you don't even know what it is yet. So anyway, have to be a member of the society, and it will be a closed event. So moving along, we're almost running out of time, but not really because I go long all the time. 
So what we haven't got to yet, we've got to Ben uh, and JRZs. And this is <laughs> a little lead into here, and you'll see why. <coughs> Everybody knows I have asthma, and it's drizzly. It's been cold and drizzly and rainy, and it just it just kills me. Uh, I want to show, uh, we did the, the strange last week, and we've got kind of a special set of JRZs this week that are going out to uh, uh, Paul. And uh, the, the question I think Terry, Terry posted is, uh, are JRZs just for V8s? And the answer is no. Uh, Paul's got a, a V6, I think it's a 2012 V6 Mustang. That, uh, he's actually going to be uh, uh, a special, uh, special guest next week to tell us about uh, his adventures of the V6 Mustang and running against V8 Mustangs, which is, he's got kind of a cool story. But anyway, he, he's he got a rear grip kit and front grip kit. He has some some okay shocks and springs, but he's he's, he's doing a whole banana. He's moving up to JRZs and the new rear suspension. He, he was one of the first 10. And what I wanted to show you, of course, with the JRZs, we do the same thing as a strange I showed you last week. We've got the, the torsion release bearing, we got the main uh, main spring, the uh, spacer, and then the uh, uh, helper spring. And then with the GRZs, you get this cool little adjuster on top. And then on the front, it's pretty much the same thing. And you, you get you put coilovers for me, and they come just like this, come pre-assembled, and I put an initial adjustment in them. And you see, this is a single adjustable, so it's got rebound on the top. And the first of all, I asked a question about uh, Adjusting single adjustable shocks, and that's uh, that's like way, way, way too big of a question to try to do just on Saturday morning. Uh, I know we we talked about we talk about that in the Speed Therapy Academy, uh, and you know shock adjustment it's it's sort of like an art, magic, and guessing all at the same time. Uh, when get, get shocks, may I give you an initial adjustment, uh, sort of like a base adjustment, and then along with that, there's a, a little nifty packet of stuff comes with JRZs. It's got my setup sheet on there. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it gives the springs, spring rates, and the initial adjustment. And then a little bit of a tuning guide, like 101 tuning. Uh, and uh, this is kind of unique because uh, it's, it's a V6, or it's a track car. So I drop down from the 650 to a 600. Uh, we'll see how that works. If it's a little too much spring for them, we can always back that down to 550. But uh, I want to, want to see the more spring you put in the Mustang, the better they turn, the better, the faster they are. And typically, you know, with a, a live axle car, if it's a 600 front, I'm looking at 375, 400 rear, uh, depending on a whole bunch of things, uh, wheel size, tire size, tire compound, horsepower. Uh, but I, I always do the front springs and then make an adjustment with the rear springs and how I want the car to work. Well, for this particular car, I don't know if you can see that or not, Front spring rate 600, rear spring rate 600. Hmm. We'll talk about that when we talk about the the, uh, the new rear suspension. Uh, so you run the same spring rate front and rear, which is exactly what I do on uh, my IRS cars, my 9904 Cobra IRS cars. We'll run the same spring rate front and rear. Uh, if the front's too low, the rear might be 25 pounds higher in the back, but IRS cars will spring in the same front and rear. Uh, so here's here is the live axle Mustang with spring like an IRS car. You'll find out about that when we do the reveal. Uh, something else uh, when we get this, you see a nice little kit. There's a little the spanner wrench and see this little, little pack with a little, little blue thing in there. It's something a little extra I throw in the uh, adjuster knobs on the top. Now you have to take them off to take the shock off or install it. You, I don't know if you see a little tiny bitsy bitsy tiny hole. There's two set screws that hold the adjuster knob on, and they are a 1.5 millimeter set screw. Now, aren't too many people have 1.5 millimeter in the toolbox, so what I do is I include a 1.5 millimeter Allen, and that little blue paper on there is, I mean, I, I got really tired of going to my toolbox and digging through all my Allens to come up with a, the right Allen for JRZs, and I finally said, I'll just put this blue tape on so I can find it right away. So, and it's also because it's so small, it makes it tougher to lose. So I just automatically, uh, for the for the 1.5 millimeter uh, Allens that we send out with, with the, the GRGs, I flag it just like I do my own. So, and then, oh, and then of course, 
get stickers. The, you've got all the strange stickers, the, the uh, iBox stickers for shocks are in the bag. You get the GRG stickers. And this is the cool thing about GRGs. They kind of come with this two mats on the top of the box, <coughs> which are really handy for your bench. But I keep telling you about these are kind of you know, built to order. Well, this set was hand built by and tested by. Okay. If you guys can see that, here, see that signature. Uh, I'm, I'm, maybe wood, huh? Maybe wood something, but it was signed off by this actually BB. Uh, so every set of shocks is hand built to order and tested and then signed off, which, which make them, you know, they're, they're a really premium shock. Uh, oh, Speed Therapy Academy. April is the next one. I know we had a lot of people that, that really want us to delay it a little bit. It'll be better with their schedule, so we're doing that. Also, it gives us a little more time to prepare because uh, we've got a lot of things to do. We're, we're trying to get this new rear suspension launched, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's taking a lot. So with that, uh, I see her picking up, maybe picking up her, her uh, computer and coming up here to talk about questions. Uh, oh, no, she's answering a text. No, it was an email. Well, we don't have a lot of questions today. No, not a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I answered a bunch during the uh, during the during the, yeah. the show. So uh, let's see. Kobe has another question, and this is a long one. I'm going to put it up so you can see it, and I'll read it up. Or do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Uh, right. After nine hundred thousand plus hard miles, my LSD finally failed. I'm guessing that's limited slip differential. Yeah. And not a not a GM LS motor. <laughs> Field in my S197. I just had it replaced with an Eaton True Track. Just driving it home from the shop, it feels different. Is there any break in period I need to be aware of? Is there a learning curve involved? I heard it significantly improves handling over the stock LSD. Yeah, I come, the the, uh, the True Track is torque sensing. Uh, we use uh, you, you made a good choice, by the way. We use we use torsions. Uh, we used to use wave track, but we can't get them anymore. Uh, we used to actually use true track in our uh, on the nine inch uh, rear ends for S197s that uh, Strange builds for us. Uh, and, and what it is, it's, it's a it's a, a torque sensing differential. And what I mean by that is, you know, with if you don't have if you have an open differential, you put your foot down, you make a black mark with one tire. I mean, that's the way it used to be forever. Uh, and then they go to, to positive to to a positive traction which in essence is a bunch series of clutches which rub against each other and they help to make both wheels turn uh, at the same time, but they will wear out. Uh, the thing about torque sensing is it's, it's, it's got a whole bunch of like uh, uh, worm gears and uh, planetary gears in there. And in short, long story, story, long story short, is they actually adjust, they send the torque uh, the torque of the engine to the tire that has the most grip. So, which is kind of opposite of a normal posi. So whatever tire has the most grip is what's going to get the torque. So, and, you know, in the extreme example, you could, you could start on one, one, one wheel on one tire on asphalt, one tire on gravel and hit the gas. And, you know, the, the tire that's got the most grip is going to get the most torque. So, <coughs> <coughs> So as far as, you know, it feels different because it's the back of the car is working different. Uh, and you're going to find if you drive it on track, it's like, whoa, this really helps a lot. It really help you on corner exit. Because, uh, again, you're, you're waiting for the axle to settle. Uh, and traditional, traditional, uh, pot, the traditional, like, uh, positive traction unit, you got to wait and wait and wait because if you get to the gas too soon, the outside tire gets overloaded. And you know the car gets loose in the back uh, with a with a torsion or or the, the Eaton. Uh, you don't have to wait quite as long uh, because you're going to have it's going to adjust the torque. Uh, if uh, now if you have a rear grip kit one with the with the lower rear roll center and the adjusted geometry, you don't have to wait as long because you know the car's not going to roll. You're going to be able to get to the gas sooner. So I mean having a, having that type of differential is, is a big plus. I think you'll. It's, you know, it's interesting you notice a difference because I, I just drive cars and, you know, 
I've always driven it with torsion, so I don't know that it's been so long since I drove regular and don't even, I don't know if I can tell the difference. So um, that is it for the questions. Calvin did mention when uh, Ben was talking about the helmets and you were talking about uh, helmet head. Yeah. He said you could shave your head. Well, that, that yeah, that always works. And then you pull the helmet off, you got gl you got glisten head. Okay, we do have a, a question from Anibus that just came up. JRZ R1 compared to, uh, I think it's maximum motorsport, JR1 coilover, stock rear location versus true coilover. 285, 40, 18 tires, does true coilover need bracket upgrade? That sounds like almost a 15 minute. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a 15 minute. I, I can tell you in uh, the shortest amount of time, I mean, the JRZs are a, a European shock. Their primary business is very, very high-end racing shocks in Europe. They are, I mean, uh, you know, they, they build like $10,000 racing shocks, not a set, a piece. Uh, so they, they are really high-end. And the, the way I got associated with JRZ is back in 2011, and my late, uh, late son Paul in the World Challenge, uh, he was, you know, obviously, for those that know, he just dominated the series. And one of his keys were the, uh, okay, two keys. One, one was the brakes. And as you people that follow know, we've actually brought those brakes back in, in a dramatically improved version, the Pro for our race brakes we have. And uh, that was you know, his his brakes for that championship and the, and the Jersey shocks, which I was really amazed. I mean, he Paul had ama amazing racecraft and he had a tremendous skill of being able to use the curves curbs in racing they can either be your nemesis or your friend if you know how to use curbs you can pick up time if you don't they can upset the car if you have a really good set of shocks with really good valving you can use the curbs if you don't have a really good set of cars the curbs are going to upset the set the car uh, the jrz's he's had they were the motorsport shocks were just exceptional it's just an exceptional race shock and uh, you know, talking with them you know, they, uh, you know, the, his, I think his were like $10,000 a set. They're like the cheap motorsport shots, but uh, that was too much for our, our, our people. So, I mean, uh, JRZ went to work and they came out with the RS line. <coughs> it was not just Mustang. It covers everything now, which essentially European level race shocks kind of brought down to a price point for the, the club and track day people. Uh, you know, the other, there's a lot of other shocks that are made in the United States that, you know, are, I would say that they're good. There's a lot of good shocks out there, you know, but the big difference with JRZ is, you know, their, their lineage and their heritage. They go back a long time. It's all race shocks for the street. And then I know the, some of the other shocks, uh, as far as a true coilover versus a pretend coilover, uh, we used to actually make our own coilovers way back when, before coilovers were, you know, I was been using coilovers for you know, 25 years. And we used to get the sleeve and drop it onto the, like the Bill Stein and the Coney's and turn them into a coilover. Uh, obviously, we don't do that anymore because we've got coilovers for, for S197 and F Fox S197, S195, and 550s. We've got coilovers for all of them. But, you know, I, I prefer a true coilover because the body and everything is designed about that. As far as brackets for the coilover, you know, for the GRZs, you know, we don't need a bracket in the back. Uh, they, they retain the, uh, the OE type bayonet mount. And then, as I talked about last week, on the bottom, we don't use uh, rubber bushing up against the body. That's, that's Delron, uh, because you're putting a lot of a lot of load right into that point. Uh, we do use a really hard rubber on top to get some dampening, but we don't you know, we don't have to you don't have to shift over. I mean, we have same thing with with our our strange. You know, we have we retain the bayonet mount, so it's just easy. Uh, you know, just it, it bolt them in. Okay, just want to make one comment. We have a ton of viewers that view the replay. And I just want you to know the replay viewers that if you have a question from any of the uh, cars and coffees, uh, or especially the last one, just put it in the comments and we'll follow up with you. Uh, we view those a couple times a week just to make sure we're catching everybody's okay. questions. We're also sending them in, uh, if you're in Speed Therapy Society, you can send your questions into there. Mm -hmm. So whew, I think I got through everything. Uh, next week, I'm all the way down to next week. Oh, my Speed Therapy Academy starts in April. I said that it's the last or next to the last Thursday in February, we'll do the reveal mm -hmm. on the new rear suspension. 
it's going to blow your blow your minds, especially when I tell you how good it works. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everybody. Uh, left-handed signs. You're in left-handed signs again. Oh, thank you. Thanks for all your impact, people. You had that. Oh, never mind. <laughs> so thank you, our, thank you, our viewers. Uh, I really appreciate you guys being here. Share if you like what I'm talking about. And uh, thanks for the, the impact people for being here. Thanks for Ben, especially, for imparting some of his knowledge. And for those that sign up for the Academy, uh, you're going to see him again uh, talking, uh, doing a full full explanation of, uh, of safety in the Academy. And next week, uh, pros and cons of V6 versus V8. Uh, it's kind of going to be the discussion. And, you know, we already saw Paul Shocks, and he's actually going to be a, uh, a customer spotlight, talking about his experience with uh, – Kenny Brown suspension on his V6, and it's, it's kind of a chuckle. I had a good time uh, talking with him. So with that, I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Remember, uh, register for the reveal starting next Saturday. Mm -hmm. Sorry, next Saturday. And with that, send in your questions, and we will – it's been a great day, and we will see you all next week. Bye.